Welcome to Noir Alley, coming to you from Bar 355 in Oakland, California. This week we're getting into the swing of the season with a rarity that might become a new Christmas favorite for some of you. If your taste in holiday stories leans toward an unhealthy mix of misery, cruelty, and perversion. In that case, consider I Wouldn't Be In Your Shoes, a 1948 B offering from Monogram Pictures, an early Christmas present from me to you. This 70-minute quickie is based on a story by Cornell Woolrich that first appeared in the March 12, 1938 issue of Detective Fiction Weekly. It shares several of the same themes as last week's movie, Black Angel, based on the author's 1943 novel. But that movie relocated the mystery to Los Angeles. This one sticks with Woolrich's home turf, New York City, even if it's mostly studio sets. No one depicted more convincingly the tough luck lives of working stiffs scraping by in tiny tenement apartments, their desperate lives at the mercy of cruel coincidence or miserable fate. Then the cops come knocking at three o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve because somebody's dead in the building. The victim in this one is described as an aged miser definitely not what you want as your epitaph. Accused of killing this miser is a down-on-his-heels dancer who threw his tap shoes at some yowling cats on the night in question. Shoe prints at the scene, of course, proved to be a perfect match. Soon the guy's taxi dancer wife has to enlist the aid of a love-struck cop to try and clear her husband before he's executed. Just your typical Cornell Woolrich feel-bad suspense yarn. Now, there are a number of significant differences between Woolrich's original story and the movie made from it, but the Woolrich vibe is well translated, thanks to screenwriter Steve Fisher, himself a prolific writer of pulp fiction in the 1930s. He's also one of the few people who could actually claim a friendship with the reclusive Woolrich. But where Woolrich had washed out in his attempt at becoming a Hollywood screenwriter in the early 30s, he returned to Manhattan to write novels and magazine stories exclusively. Fisher parlayed his pulp experience into a long and lucrative Hollywood career. In fact, this script combines elements from the writer's two most well-known works. But I can't say more without giving away some of the story's surprises. Direction of the film was in the very experienced hands of 67-year-old William Nye, who'd made well over a hundred movies at this point, beginning in 1914. This was his penultimate production, and despite the tiny budget and meager shooting schedule, Nye brings a certain amount of panache to the proceedings, aided by the camera work of Max Stengler and some pretty good production design for such a low-budget affair. They clearly spent all the money before it came to scoring, because the film's biggest drawback is its reliance on stock music. The overwrought cues are worse than the most melodramatic radio show. Don Castle, who plays the accused man, was in the midst of a series of B-mysteries made for Monogram, including two others with co-star Regis Toomey, High Tide and The Guilty, which was also based on a Woolrich story. In all of them, Toomey plays a cop, which he did so often he could have filed for a pension. Also starring Elise Knox and Charles D. Brown with a terrific gallery of supporting players enacting Woolrich's vision of city dwellers both creepy and compassionate, here is the second feature produced by Walter Mirisch. He'd go on to make acclaimed films like The Magnificent Seven and In the Heat of the Night, but you gotta start someplace. And here is where Walter Mirisch started. From 1948, I wouldn't be in your shoes. <laughs> 